Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I deeply regret and apologize for my language and some of my past language. President Biden's pick for White House budget chief tries to win over the critics this week, but pro-lifers raise alarm over what near attendance confirmation would mean for the taxpayer funding of abortion and beyond. Joining us in studio for an exclusive interview is the former director of the Office of Management and Budget, Russ Vogt. He gives us inside details about what the OMB office means for the pro-life movement. A vote against abortion survivors. 13 Catholic senators voted against the Born Alive Amendment last week, an amendment which calls for medical care for babies who survive botched abortions. We tell you who those senators are and what the Catholic Church has to say about that. And taking action. Arizona's Senate panel approves several pro-life provisions, including a measure that bans abortions for babies with Down syndrome. We'll speak to the Republican state senator who sponsored the bill. President Biden has supported repeal of the Hyde Amendment. And so, you know, I will anticipate how that operates in the budget process, but that is a position that he took in the campaign and has held. President Joe Biden's choice to leave the Office of Management and Budget near a Tandon tries to convince senators she will leave partisan politics behind if confirmed. That testimony is from her Senate hearing this week. Tandon, a former advisor to Hillary Clinton and the president of Center for American Progress, has been a harsh critic of Republicans and pro-lifers on social media. She's made the depiction of people of faith as using a cudgel. If confirmed, this will be the third time Tandon has worked in a Democratic administration. Our next guest, the former OMB director, stands in stark contrast to Neera Tandon. While pro-life groups raise alarm over Tandon's role in the OMB, they praised previous OMB director Russell Vogt for being instrumental in stopping Title X taxpayer funding of Planned Parenthood and other abortion businesses and protecting private insurers from being forced to cover elective abortions and in safeguarding conscience protections for pro-life health care workers and entities. Russell Vogt, the former director of the Office of Management and Budget, is here with us. Vogt served as director of OMB for two years. He was a member of President Trump's cabinet and was responsible for overseeing the implementation of the president's policy, management, and deregulatory agendas across the executive branch. Russ, welcome. Uh, first, what is your reaction to Neera Tandon's nomination as the next OMB director? Yeah, it is very consistent with all of the hard left uh, nominees that this president has put forward. Uh, she will be in a position, if confirmed, to be able to ensure that his policies are reflected throughout the federal government. Really, that is the role of the Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she is something. She is someone that uh, is consistent with his leftist agenda. I mean, he has tried to, um, I think, govern with a tone of, of moderation. But if you look within the policies, they are they're just as hard left as we expected. So, um, you know, she's going through the process that I went through. Uh, not the most comfortable process, uh, but it is it is certainly one f that should trouble pro-lifers from the standpoint of the policy agenda that she'll be asked to to uh, mm. articulate. I'd love to speak more to that. It may not seem very obvious that the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, does play a crucial role when it comes to the abortion issue at the executive level. For those of us who have never worked in the White House, uh, can you break down the importance of that specific mm -hmm. office, the office you directed, and why pro-lifers need to pay attention to what happens there? You know, OMB directors get uh, the title of budget director, mm -hmm. but really the Office of Management Budget is designed to execute a president's agenda throughout the federal government. So every regulation goes through the Office of Management Budget, all resource decisions. So if an administration wants to spend money at the Department of Health and Human Service, that decision will come through the mm -hmm. Office of Management and Budget. And then we also have a lot of opportunity to work on management issues. So you're really a nerve center from the federal government's perspective to be able to put uh, a high-level policy position into effect and to make sure that the bureaucracy, quite frankly, isn't going in a different direction. And so 
uh, you know, I think the choice of, of Nira to that position is, is reflective of, of, the, of President Biden wanting someone that's consistent with his ideology to be able to use that, all the authority and power that that office has. Mm. During your time as OMB director, what specific pro-life accomplishments were you able to directly work on and advance? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the beauty of working in the Trump administration is the president had um, a very strong commitment to life. And mm -hmm. so we knew, for those of us who were pro-life within the administration, that any decision that got to the Resolute desk was going to go in a different way. So it really empowered us to be able uh, to push pro-life policies. You know, two that I am, am particular uh, fond of having worked on was uh, the effort to, to bar the co-location of Planned Parenthood facilities to say that if you're going to be in the business of health, then you have to be co differently located than uh, your, your abortion activities. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, money is fungible and there's a reason they wanted to, to group those centers together and as a result, Planned Parenthood said we're going to get out of the Title X program. So mm -hmm. that was a major, major uh, reform that we put forward. The, and then the second one, uh, which did ex have a, a quite a bit of debate within the administration was whether we were going to get out of the business of federal funding of, of uh, field tissue research. Mm. And this was something that was particularly of, of importance because, uh, you know, the scientific community was offering up all of the things that could be done uh, with this research. And, you mm -hmm. know, the president came down on the pro-life side uh, once again. And that was something that, uh, you know, we took to the Resolute Desk and, and took to the Oval Office and, and uh, it was a really important uh, policy decision that the president made. Mm. President Joe Biden has been in office for three weeks now and he's already rescinded the Mexico City policy and he has directed Health and Human Services to review the Protect Life rule, that rule that you were just describing, which is a sign that's about to be gone as well, likely. How significant is all of this and what's your reaction as someone who directly worked on those policies? The speed at which he has been moving forward is just amazing in the sense that uh, he is just using executive order after executive order to pull back these. And when it says, you know, we're just reviewing it, what he's doing there is not necessarily saying I'm considering it. He's saying to the American people, I need to go through particular legal processes to make sure that if we move in, a di in that direction, it can sus be sustained in court. And so this is not good news that, you know, it's, it hasn't been done yet. It, it is just merely the fact that we have a battle on our hands. Uh, speaking of HHS, what's your reaction to President Biden's nominee to head the HHS, uh, California Attorney General Xavier Becerra? Very concerned about it. Uh, he was in charge of a very consequential office in, in the state of California. So he not only is hard left in his policies, uh, pro-choice, uh, radical ideologies, but he's also led a very big institution and has been involved in, uh, law, in, in legal suits that, from a standpoint of knowing how the government works, uh, I think he'll know quite a bit. And so uh, I have substantial concerns about that and how he'll work with the Office of Management and Budget. Can you explain how, in your role as OMB director, how closely you worked with the HHS secretary? What was that relationship like there? You work very closely. You remember the cabinet together. Mm -hmm. uh, you're often on the phone with each other trying to work through particular issues. Um, and this was an, an area where, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a good relationship with Alex Azar. Uh, but your o OMB director is, is kind of, you're within the White House complex. And so you're a part of all of those policy discussions, but you're also translating those for the agencies. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot to a new topic now. You are launching the Center for American Restoration and its advocacy arm, American Restoration Action. It's been reported the goal is to keep important cultural issues alive and at the forefront. Tell us about your plans with your new group and is the pro-life issue one you plan to prominently work on? It is, and I, I laid out our vision in an op-ed recently and pro-life was number one mm -hmm. uh, on our list of, of issues. You know, my view is that for too long, the center-right movement has not engaged enough on the cultural issues. Mm. These are the issues that get you disinvited from a, a dinner party, that causes tension with your neighbors, and yet those are the issues that are the are where we're getting the onslaught the most from the left. And so, our challenge is to be able to restore a consensus in this country about what it means to be American, but to arm people, people grassroots, families, communities, to be able to have these conversations in a way that actually convinces people so that mm -hmm. we can add people to our, our, our ranks. And I think the pro-life movement itself is a model 
of a movement that over 50 years has been able to take an issue and bring converts to the side so that we are in a much better situation uh, now than we were in the 1970s, although we have tremendous work to do. Right. The pro-life movement's only growing stronger. Henry Olson wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last week about your new think tank and the need to flesh out ideas that a serious governing movement needs. That being said, would you say the pro-life movement has any sort of equivalent of this? And you've already said it seems it will have an institutional presence at your new group. It will. It'll be in, on the pro-life issue. I think the movement is is great and really developed, and I think we'll just slide in alongside of other great organizations that have, over the last 40 or 50 years, really been able to uh, talk about the the the, mm -hmm. the issue of getting rid of abortion. But we want to take it one step further, you know, and and have a culture of life that is celebrated. Uh, you know, I look at it from the standpoint of I have a child with cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm. and we have a fight on our hands within that community because. There are so many people in this country that when they get that uh, information from a doctor or a nurse that they're going to have a, a cystic fibrosis baby, they 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 go to a, a dark place, and and we want to be a voice for the, for those with conditions like that or uh, the dis individuals with disability that. That this is a great place and that they have dignity and they have human worth and as a result America is a great place for them as well. Absolutely. We only have about a minute left but I understand at the Center for American Restoration you'll also directly address cancel culture. Uh, how much of a threat is cancel culture to the pro-life movement do you think? Uh, increasingly, it is it is something that I think people are going to be very concerned about in the sense that anytime we engage in these cultural issues in pro-life, I think because of the work of the last 50 years is a little bit more accepted than it once was. Uh, but we still have a fight on our hand with regard to conscience protections. And anytime you're going against culture, culture, the high, the high points of culture is going to be fighting back and trying to minimize our voice. And so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and that is a particular place that we will focus on. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Russell Vogt, former director of the Office of Management and Budget and president of the Center for American Restoration. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us now on Skype is Mallory Quigley, Vice President of Communications for the Susan B. Anthony List. Mallory, welcome. First, I'd like to get your reaction to our interview with Russ Vogt. Can you speak to Russ Vogt's leadership and what you think his OMB legacy will be when it comes to the pro-life issue. Yeah, what a fantastic man, um, a great pro-life advocate. He, like you said, you know, played a key role in implementing the Trump-Pence Protect Life rule, which had the impact of defunding Planned Parenthood of up to $60 million, drawing that bright line of separation between abortion and family planning. Uh, and he, he helped with conscience protections for pro-life insurers uh, and, and just so many more things. It's a key role. And Russ shares in that Trump-Pence legacy, having set the standard, raised the bar very high for future pro-life administrations in establishing a to-do list of all the things that are just automatic when we have a pro-life White House. Mallory, Neera Tandon is set to take over as the next OMB director pending Senate confirmation. How concerning is this for pro-lifers? Why is that role so consequential? Yeah, well, Russ explained it very well, you know, that this is the the office that is a clearinghouse for the administration's policy priorities because they set the budget. And, uh, you know, when you look at, at his legacy, it really is providing a backwards roadmap mm -hmm. for um, Miss Tandem to reverse all of those things and look for as many slush funds for the abortion industry as she can. This is a, you know, director of Center for American Progress. It's a very uh, pro-abortion uh, liberal group. Planned Parenthood has been her top cheerleader throughout this process. And so this is a concerning appointment from the pro-life perspective, for mm -hmm. sure. We heard Russ Vogt explain the significance of the HHS department as well in advancing pro-life accomplishments. Xavier Becerra is Biden's nominee to be the next HHS secretary. What should we know about Becerra and what's your message to the Senate ahead of his confirmation hearing? Yes, well, uh, Becerra is uh, somehow known, uh, you know, the media is reporting on him as kind of being a moderate guy. He couldn't be anything uh, he, he, he could not be more radical, actually, on when it comes to abortion policy in particular. Becerra has been around for a long time. He served in Congress. He voted against the partial birth abortion ban and then had a, a record of 
not just being a passive pro-abortion supporter, but really an active uh, advocator of abortion policy, going after pro-life journalists in uh, in California, David Daleiden, Sandra Merritt, persecuting pro-life pregnancy centers and pro-life insurance companies and schools and churches. So he has a, a radical adv advocacy record on this. And we want our senators to know that Susan B. Anthony List will be keeping grassroots informed about for Sarah's record, and we don't want them to vote to confirm him. Mm. Mallory, while I have you real quick, can I get your reaction to news that Elise Hoag, president of NARAL, is stepping down? NARAL is essentially the antithesis to the Susan B. Anthony list. Yeah, it's one of our um, one of the groups that we come up against head to head, especially in elections. They've been in decline for the last several years, and I read with great interest the interview she did with the New York Times. I found a lot of the messaging to be contradictory. Um, and reflective of some of the messaging disagreements we've seen coming from the pro-abortion movement over the last few years, whether or not we're uh, shouting your abortion or this is something that to be you know, treated more delicately. Uh, she did say that the courts are the biggest threat to the pro-abortion movement, and for the first time in decades, that is true, thanks to President Trump and the transformation of the judiciary. We don't know what's next for her, but I do know she has young children at home, and there's always the hope that hearts and minds will be changed. So I'll be praying mm -hmm. for her, and I encourage all the viewers to do so as well. Absolutely. It's interesting news to watch. Mallory Quigley with the Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Turning now to an incredibly important pro-life story we're monitoring on Capitol Hill this week, the House and Senate are using what is called the reconciliation process as a way to pass a COVID relief package. Lawmakers will consider various bills to begin the process of passing it. This week, while the Senate is busy with former President Donald Trump's impeachment trial, House representatives are crafting their bills. We think it's important you know this, because during this time, we are closely monitoring these drafts and markups for any attempts for pro-abortion Democrats to violate the Hyde Amendment and increase abortion funding in these bills. And this is where you, our viewers, have a big role to play. For this week's call to action, go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell your representative to defend against any radical attempt to increase abortion funding in the COVID-19 relief package. COVID-19 relief should not include abortion funding whatsoever, but we know there are attempts to still sneak abortion funding in there. We need you to get in contact with your member of Congress now and petition them to be ready to defend the Hyde Amendment throughout this entire reconciliation process. We cannot let any legislation pass that would fund abortions at Planned Parenthood and the rest of the abortion industry. We will continue to closely monitor what happens on Capitol Hill, but this is a time the pro-life movement needs you to step in. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell your representative to defend against any increase in abortion funding in the COVID-19 relief package. Coming up, 13 Catholic senators voted against abortion survivors last week. I speak out and call them out by name once we return. Plus, an Arizona Senate panel approves many pro-life provisions, including a measure that bans abortions because a baby has Down syndrome. We speak to the woman behind that bill. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. 13 Catholic U.S. Senators voted last week against a measure to require medical care for babies who survive abortion attempts. That is this week's Speak Out segment. This amendment, modeled on the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, is an opportunity to come together and to defend babies. It's pretty simple, actually. Every baby, whether she's born in a state-of-the-art hospital with a NICU unit or whether she's born in an abortion clinic in a strip mall, every baby is born with dignity and is created in God's image, and she deserves care. That was Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska speaking on the Senate floor last week before a roll call vote was taken on his Born Alive Amendment. The amendment, based on his piece of legislation, requires babies who are born alive during botched abortions receive the same standard of care any other newborn would receive. 
this should be a common sense amendment that we should provide care to a living, breathing baby. But the amendment failed in the Senate. It did not receive the necessary 60 votes to be included in the budget resolution. It received only 52 votes in favor and 48 votes against. And to add insult to injury, 13 of those 48 senators who voted against the Born Alive Amendment are Catholic. Here are the 13 Catholic senators, all Democrat, who voted against the Born Alive Amendment last week. They are Senators Cantwell, Cortez Maestro, Durbin, Gillibrand, Kane, Kelly, Lehigh, Lujan, Markey, Menendez, Murray, Padilla, and Reed. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, quote, human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. And this very week, Pope Francis told diplomats at the Vatican that the right to life is a foundational human right. The Holy Father said it's, quote, painful for him to see more countries move away from their inalienable duty to protect human life from conception to natural death. There is no room for argument or debate when it comes to the Catholic Church's teaching on life. The Church does not exclude a right to life for babies who were almost killed from abortion. No. Abortion survivors, innocent babies who are born against the odds, they are deserving of protection, of medical care, of the same love afforded to other newborns. We know abortion survivors exist. We've featured Melissa Odin and Claire Colwell on this very show. By voting against this amendment, those 13 Catholic senators were voting against caring for lives like Melissa's and Claire's. Catholic politicians, once elected as public figures, become public ambassadors for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and they are elected to serve U.S. citizens. Those are two very serious and great responsibilities. But these 13 Catholic senators who voted against the Born Alive Amendment last week have forfeited both their responsibility to care for their most vulnerable citizens and their responsibility as baptized Catholics to be prophets through a witness of truth. Let us pray for these 13 Catholic senators who voted against an amendment to protect abortion survivors. Let us pray they have a conversion of heart and become convicted to protect the youngest among us. An Arizona Senate panel approves a bill that bans medical providers from performing abortions due to a genetic abnormality such as Down syndrome. The bill was approved last week by a Republican majority state Senate panel. Republican State Senator Nancy Bardo, who sponsored the bill, says it's important to make, quote, fixes to our laws to protect the most vulnerable among us. The bill is expected to pass on the Senate floor. Joining us now via Skype is Arizona Republican State Senator Nancy Bardo. Thank you for being here with us. Can you tell us why you decided to sponsor this pro-life bill and what else needs to happen for it to become law in Arizona? Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, yes, I... Well, you know, it's been clear that throughout the world and in, in the United States, more and more children with disabilities are being singled out for abortion, and they are the most vulnerable among us. It's, it's um, estimated that about 67 percent of children uh, with, with disabilities are snuffed out in, by abortion in the United States. In some countries, it's much worse. This bill, 14, um, 1457, Senate Bill 1457, will make that illegal to uh, simply target these vulnerable uh, children with genetic abnormal, uh, anomalies for abortion uh, solely because of their disability. Um, it does several other very important things as well, but you know, just handling this thing alone will save so many unborn children that are at risk in Arizona. Uh, to your question about what needs to happen next, well, it needs to go to the full Senate floor, where I'm sure we'll have a very robust debate about the bill and why these children are at risk and why women um, need to make sure that they 
have every opportunity to, uh, to save those children in the United States and in Arizona in particular. Absolutely. Can you explain, if enacted, what kind of repercussions would happen if an abortionist went against it and aborted a baby with Down syndrome or because of another condition? Well, it'd be the same penalty as if a physician was um, uh, performing an abortion for uh, for racist reasons uh, or for sex selection. Those criminal penalties would be the same as for this. The measure that you introduced and sponsored also requires that the remains of unborn children be buried or cremated, and it grants civil rights to the unborn. Tell us more about that aspect. Well, you know, the, the unborn children are little human beings at conception. Science backs that up. Biology backs that up. And they deserve uh, to have their remains honored. And so this just makes sure to give the woman that opportunity. Uh, the other thing that the, the bill does that's very important, it makes sure that women um, are not... Uh, provided a medical or a chemical abortion through the mail. Um, you know, those are much more dangerous. Arizona State Senator Nancy Bardo, thank you for your time and for your pro-life leadership at the state level. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.